No, hello everyone. Uh, uh, welcome uh, to the next session uh, of uh, this uh, session room. And uh, the, the next talk uh, will be about OptaPlanner uh, AI on Quarkus uh, for uh, school time, time, time tabling. And uh, it will be presented by Geoffrey Desmet. And also, I would like to encourage you if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, you can use uh, QA uh, tab uh, here on Hopin. And uh, uh, Geoffrey will ask the question either during uh, the presentation or in the end. Uh, so, uh, stage is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Lubomir. Yeah, and yeah, if there's questions, just just ask them in the chat. I'm happy. Uh, I won't be monitoring the chat myself, but Lubomir, if you see one, um, it would be great if, if you could help bring them on screen. Yeah, sure. Um, if I see that, I'll try to answer, of course. So here we go. Um, Opto Planner AI on Quarkus, right? So um, this talk is going to talk about artificial intelligence, um, but it's not going to talk about machine learning. Um, there's much more in AI than machine learning. It's going to talk about constraint solving, about solving planning and scheduling problems. Uh, and of course, specifically, we'll do that with Opto Planner. Right. So um, about 15 years ago, 16 years this year, um, I started an open source project, uh, nothing serious. And through the years, it became very serious. Now it's all used across the globe um, and I'm working on it with a team. So uh, let me take you through that if you want to implement a use case with that. And I'll be focusing specifically today on the school timetabling problem. So what we're going to build with OptoPlanner and with Quarkus it's basically this application where you need to, when you push the solve button, the green big uh, button over there, that we're going to assign um, these uh, less, these uh, lessons, such as English, chemistry, math, biology, and so forth, to rooms and to uh, time slots. Now you might be thinking, okay, that that doesn't seem so hard, and why is there, why is this artificial intelligence? Right? Let me explain you the problem, how, how difficult it is. So um, we have a number of lessons, like math, chemistry, French, history, uh, taught by uh, teachers, for example, Alan Turing, Marie Curie, and so forth, and to a certain uh, group of students, like the ninth grade, the 10th grade, right? And then we have a number of rooms, room A and B, and we have a number of time slots, such as 8.30 to 9.30, 9.30 to 10.30. And we need to decide which of these lessons go into which room at which time. So we can see here we have four options to put them in. Will we put the math lesson in room A or in room B? And will we do that at 8.30 or at 9.30? Now, there's a number of constraints. First constraint is that some of these lessons have the same students. So for example, math and chemistry, they both are taught to the ninth grade. So that means that those two lessons cannot happen at the same time. They can't be in the same time slot. Chemistry and French are taught by Marie Curie. So that means that they have the same teacher. So those two cannot also not occur in the same time. And then French and history um, are also again taught to the same students, the 10th grade. So what are we going to do? We're going to give this to uh, OptoPlan, uh, a constraint solver, and OptoPlan will give us, give us a, a solution. And this is how a solution looks like. As you can see here, first of all, um, there's never two um, two lessons in the same room, right? But also math and chemistry have the same uh, student group, but they're actually uh, not at the same time. French history, same student group, not at the same time. Chemistry and French have the same teacher, Marie Curie, and Marie Curie can actually go to both of our, teach both of our lessons because those two lessons are not at the same time, right? And that is the challenge, of course, with planning problems, with scheduling problems. There's a number of constraints that you need to take into account and you want to solve. Now you might be thinking, how hard can it be, right? Um, you might think, I can just write a, f a couple of for loops and that will probably just fix this, right? Why would I need anything beyond that? Well, how long would it take? How many possibilities are there to assign those four lessons into those four rooms, right? So we have, uh, we could, first of all, this is the math lesson, let's first assign that one. We could take four different spots for that. We could assign it in room A at 8.30 or in room B at 8.30 room A at 9.30 or room B at 9.30. So four different options. Now for all of these four options, and let's say we uh, we could then assign the next le uh, lesson into any of these four slots again. So for example, if you, Matt was assigned to room A at 8.30, we could assign the history lesson to the same room at the same time, to room B at 8.30, room 
uh, room A at 9.30 and so forth, right? Uh, now, obviously, this is not that an interesting thing to investigate further because we already have two lessons in the same room. Uh, but this is basically where this problem starts branching. The, the number of combinations starts growing. And then, of course, to assign the chemistry group, again, uh, the chemistry lesson, we can, of we can, for example, continue from the second case where history is assigned to uh, room B and at 8.30. And then we could assign chemistry to first, uh, you know, the first slot, second slot, third slot, fourth slot, right? Or we could go into, in this case, where history is actually at a different time slot, but in the same room, and then start looking into, uh, again, we could assign chemistry to those four places, to those four slots. And the same we can do with the French lesson. And so we get pretty, we get a lot of combinations because we could do the same for any of these branches on here. So each of these little dots here at the, bit, uh, at the bottom, that's one of the, uh, that's a full combination of assigning those four lessons into four slots. So uh, there's a problem with this. If you look at the solutions we got of here, here's the only one where there's no two uh, lessons in the same room, but we still have a, a problem because if you remember from the previous slides, chemistry and French actually are both taught by Marie Curie. They have the same teacher. And these two lessons, history and French, have the same st students. Actually, the feasible solution, the one where um, you know, everybody could go to their, their, to their lesson and no two lessons were in the same room at the same time, is somewhere in these branches here, in, some of, in, in one of these branches. Right? So how, OK, but yeah, why not brute forces? force this why not just go across all of these possible okay uh, possible combinations right well if you have only four lessons assigned to uh, one lesson to assign to four four slots that's four states right two lessons assigned to uh, to four slots four slots that's 16 slates states uh, for three lessons that becomes 64 states for four uh, lessons that becomes 256 states and if you're assigning something like 400 lessons, which is far more realistic for a small uh, school, right? Because uh, any, any group of students will have 40 lessons a week. So that means there's only 10 groups of lessons, uh, 10 groups of, st of students there. Then you already have the number of combinations is already 400 to the power of 400, right? And that's about the same as a thousand, uh, as 10 to the power, power uh, to the power 1,040. So you get a lot of, if you want to do this brute force, you, you have to go through a lot of states. Now you could argue that maybe you don't want to investigate all of these branches, but that really doesn't matter much. That will just, you will only throw away 99% of your solution states. And that's that's not going to make a difference because 10 to the power of 40, if you throw away 99% of your solution states, that's still 10 to the power uh, 1,038 states, right? So it's, it only reduces the that 1,040 uh, power to the power 1038 that that's not really making a big of a difference right but anyway um and how long would it take to solve this right so um so how big is a search space it's n to the power n it's 400 lessons that's 10 to the power a thousand uh, and some more and just to give you an idea of how big this search space is the number of atoms in the observable universe right anything you know anything you can see every breath of air every grain of salt uh, sand Every atom in there, there's millions of millions of atoms in there, and all of those are uh, summed up together. That's still that's about 10 to the power 80, right? That's what that's the that's your, that's the general guess on that. So that number then is far far less that is than than signing 400 lessons uh, to 400 slots. So clearly brute force won't work, um, even with the fastest computers or all of the computing power on this planet, it would till, still take you millions of millions of millions of millions of millions of years. So um, we need a better way, right? And um, there's many, uh, so, and, and that's of course where a constraint solver like OptoPlanner comes into play, where we're using other algorithms to actually find that solution. Now, are there other planning problems? Um, so for example, um, it's not just lesson scheduling. A good example is employee rostering. So in the employee rostering case, we need to assign shifts to employees. So for example, we have a morning shift uh, from 6 till uh, 8 a.m. till 2 p.m., right? And we need to figure out which nurse will do that shift. Will it be you know, nurse one, nurse two, or maybe the engineer, or, or maybe the designer, right? Um, and that's, uh, that's the choices we need to make. Now, there's a number of constraints in here. It's that every employee can only have one shift per day. Uh, certain um, certain shifts require certain skills. Right? For example, in a hospital, um, 
there might be a lot of uh, regular nurses, but there could also be a, a nurse who has special skills for, like to work in the maternity ward. So any shifts that are in the maternity ward, ward would need um, specifically a, a nurse who has that particular skill, right? And and so forth, all right? And and uh, there's also um, uh, contracts. So for example, the designer in this case, he works five days in a row. There should no, he should not have any weekend work. And these are hard constraints. There's also soft constraints. So soft constraints are less important than hard constraints. If you break them, your schedule is still feasible, but you want to avoid them as much as possible. In this particular case, it's, for example, forward rotation. When you want to make sure there's enough time between two shifts for the nurses to go home, sleep, and, and come back, right? Uh, or if you want to avoid day off, uh, if you want to give people when they ask for a particular day off, you want to actually uh, give that to them, and that's the off request. So, for example, if we would be signing this nurse on this Friday to a particular shift, we would violate that the off request constraints, and uh, we would we would like to avoid that. Right? We can't always avoid that. For example, on Christmas, nobody wants to work on Christmas. You will have to break some soft constraints, but in general, you can try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, Another typical case is vehicle routing. So in the vehicle routing case, we need to uh, pick up a number of items across the country, right? And we need to decide uh, which vehicle does that and, and also in which order do they do that. And we, have, we want to minimize the travel time. Now, um, that's not just when pick, for picking up or delivering items. It's also, for example, for uh, technicians that come to your home and install cable, internet, and things like that, or any other service you need to do across the entire country, such as repair of, of, of um, electricity lines, etc. Now, what are the constraints in this? Well, if you're actually delivering uh, items, you have a capacity per vehicle, the amount of volume, the amount of uh, tonnage they can actually carry, right? And so you want to make sure that uh, if you sum up all of the capacity you need for all of those stops, it is less than the entire capacity of the vehicle. Um, there's so they might also deal with time windows where you say, okay, I need to be at that customer between 8 and 10 a.m. because we promise to be there between that time window. They're staying specifically at, at home for us uh, for that. And of course, in general, you want to reduce the entire travel time. And that's something we can do a lot by optimizing it. So just to give you an idea, um, what if you how how does this work in the real world when you when you when you use when you do a vehicle routing case with like for example what we did with Optopan, right? Well they expected by automating this the, the creation of these schedules um, that they would reduce their driving time by one percent. We had a case like that, right? Um, the result was 25% less driving time. And this was about a lot of vehicles, right? Tens of thousands of vehicles. So the result was that um, they actually reduced their CO2 emissions by more than 10 million kilograms a year because they were simply driving less to reach all of those locations with their fleet of vehicles. Um, so it's important to understand that what people are using today to solve these kinds of problems, either humans who just do the schedule, smart humans who do these schedules as, as best as they can, or relatively greedy algorithms, uh, the, 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 the homegrown implementations of, of constraint solving, let's put it like that, uh, there's typically a lot of room to improve those. And even today, we're still improving results. Um, and then there's still state-of-the-art research that is improving results further. Um, and what the, um, what's the probably the most interesting part for, for, for some audiences on this is, well, I think the CO2 emissions reduction per year is the most interesting part. but they also, by reducing their driving time by that much, they also reduced their costs uh, as a company by uh, literally in, in, nine, in nine figures. So vehicle routing is an interesting case. Uh, employee rostering will not deliver that kind of um, you know, numbers, of course, but it will make the, uh, the employees happier and, and, and increase retention. Now, there's many more uh, uh, planning cases like maintenance scheduling, you know, grips, grids, equipments, airplanes, and that kind of things. Uh, agenda scheduling, court hearings, TV ads, job shop scheduling for uh, when you're building things in a factory, and task assignment in, in general. Now, um, so the world is full of problem planning problems, and uh, I'm proposing you to use OptoPlanner uh, or open source uh, AI constraint solver to solve those. And I'm going to show you how we do that uh, now today in this meeting. So how do we build this application for school timetabling, right? How do we get to this result? Well, 
if you remember what, what we're going to do is we're going to use Quarkus for that. So what is Quarkus? Quarkus is a Java application platform and um, its tagline is that it's superson supersonic subatomic Java, right? And um, the interesting thing is it is, it is extremely fast and I'm going to show you that in a minute, all right? So um, what are we going to build? We're going to build an application where uh, starting with Quarkus, we're going to use REST easy to expose a, a REST service. You don't actually know that it's REST easy in, in below. It's just, we're going to expose a REST service. And um, then we're going to, we have a browser that goes to that service. And then we are going to store our data in a, in a relational database. Now, this part of the application I've already built, I'll take you through the code in a second. And then, on, but there is no AI in what I've built so far yet. And I will, uh, I will live code to actually add those pieces uh, uh, in a few minutes. So first of all, let's say you want to build this application from scratch. What would you do? What you would go to, you would go to code.quarkus.io. So for example, this is code.quarkus.io. You would say, okay, I want to have, let's say, hibernate, right? And then you can say, okay, I want, I uh, know this is with REST services. I want hibernate uh, either of these, right? And then I want to, for example, use OptaPlanner, right? And you add OptaPlanner. And then when you're ready, you press the uh, blue button and you get a zip with including your POM file if you use Maven or if you'd rather use Gradle. I believe that's option. That's possible too, right? Um, now, I've done that already, and I want to show you what I have here. So I have this uh, setup already, and I've added the code already for the uh, the, the non-AI parts. So as you can see here, we have a POM file. Um, it has an artifact ID. It imports the Quarkus bomb. It also already imports OptaPlanner, but it doesn't use any of that code yet. And uh, you we're using Hibernate. Uh, Panache to go to the database and we're using REST easy to expose the REST interfaces and a few other things like uh, that makes testing easier uh, and exposes a few more things. I'll explain those as we go through those. And we can see we have a couple of domain objects here like the lesson, the room, the time shots, and the timetable, right? So um, here we go. Back to the presentation for a second. So um, let's talk about the domain, right? So we need to implement a school time tabling app. So what do we need? Well, first, uh, so this is what we need to we need to implement these lessons, these rooms. We need to be able to capture that kind of data. So what are we going to do is we're going to create a few Java classes. The first class we'll create is a uh, the first class we have already is a time slot class, right? Which has a day of week, which is of the type day of week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so forth. Uh, it has a start time, like 8.30, 9.30, and an end time, like 9.30 or 10.30. Um, it has a room, like, for example, room A, room B, room C, and so forth. And then we have uh, lessons, which have a subject, like math or chemistry or uh, something like that. A teacher, like which is like Marie Curie or so forth. Now, in a real full-blown application, you would probably make a teacher its own class, which have a couple of properties. You know, they like to work on Monday mornings or not, right? Um, but in this case, I've kept it simple and it's just a string. And of course, a student group, which is a group of students. And, and again, in a real application, this might be more complex where mo you have multiple students group that might actually share students and so forth. But, uh, and it's all possible. But in this case, I've kept it simple, a simple string where it says like ninth grade or 10th grade or, or something like that. Now, these lessons get assigned to a time slot, right? And get assigned to a room. And this is, of course, the part that we will want OptoPlanner to do for us. So we will input the number of, uh, number of time slots, number of rooms, right? Whether our school has available, a number of lessons that we want to teach. And then we'll let OptoPlanner figure out which lesson goes to which time slot and which room. So let's take a look at that in, in code, right? So if we go here to the time slot class, it's a pretty simple class. It's it's a time slot. Um, it has a day of week, right? Which is, this is coming from java.time for those who are not familiar with this yet. And then the start time and end time, which is also coming from java.time, the local time. Uh, so like 8.30 and so forth. Um, these classes have an at entity annotation. This is from uh, JPA, from Hibernate. It basically says that I want to store this in the database. They also have a database ID. Uh, where we basically say this is the ID and we want it generated by the database. We don't want to mess with it ourselves. And anything beyond this, all of these classes have some constructors and some getters and setters and the two string method to make them visible on screen. But uh, most of those 
these are these are needed because we want to uh, push them into JSON, uh, and so through Jackson we push them into JSON to the to the front end to the client, right? And that's why we have those things there, most of those. Um, so we have the room also. The room class we put it in a database. It has a database ID, and the other only other field it has is a name field, right? And so that's for example room A or room B or room C. Then we have our lesson class, as explained earlier. Our lesson class, again, we put in a database, has a database ID. Subject, like math, French, and so forth. The teacher, like Marie Curie. A student group, like ninth grade. And then we have uh, basically uh, a reference to a time slot and to a room. And both of these are many-to-one relationships. So JPA needs to know that, that um, how the foreign keys in the database are mapped and so forth. It all does it automatically, but we need to tell them basically one, um, one lesson um can be uh in uh is in a time slot uh, but one time slot can have actually multiple uh lessons and and it and it will just not in the same room and the same story for the room side okay we have one more class that's the timetable class so what's the timetable class uh it's basically a list of all of our time slots a list of all of our rooms and a list of all of our lessons it's basically our entire data set why do we need this because we need to ship it to the client and so we just uh when uh, when we load the class let me just show you that when we load the class here what we do is um when we send this to the client there is this get method here and when uh the user asks for the when we go to a certain URL, we go for the timetable URL, we, we get it. That's when um, this method is called, which actually says I'm going to create a timetable from all of the uh, time slots in the database, all of the rooms in the database, and all of the lessons in the database. And I'll go through that in a second. Right. So let's see how this en ends up. Let's see if this actually works. So what I'm going to do is I am going to start uh, Maven Quarkus Dev. Of course, this is available in Gradle 2. And this basically starts my application in development mode. That means when I make a change, I can immediately see the results of those changes, right? Uh, it's complaining here with a small warning that I don't have any OptoPanner code in there, but I do have a dependency on OptoPanner. And of course, we'll fix that in a minute. So if we go back here and we go to our local host, uh, now, actually, this thing is ro rolling. You can see it's running, right? And you can see that we have a number of rooms, room A, room B, room C. We have a number of time slots, 8.30, 9.30, time 30, and so forth. We have a number of unassigned lessons. All of these lessons, like biology, chemistry, and so forth, they don't, they're not assigned to a lesson yet. And now we want to see um, the magic of OptoPlanner that assigns those to this lesson. So let's click the Solve button. But of course, we get a big fat error. Why? Because that code is not implemented yet, and that's exactly what we will will go, which we, which we'll do right now, right? So if you go to the code here, you can see there's an error here, and that's pretty much coming from here, right? When we press the solve, when we call the solve button, that green button calls this this method, it actually throws an unsupported operation exception to do so. That's something we will need to implement right now. You can see that here too. Okay, so. Um, Let's start making some 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 changes. So the but before we do, I need to explain about the uh, the data, right? There's there's some data in here as, as you've probably seen. Uh, room A, room B, room C. Where does that come from? What I've done is first of all I've created uh, repositories. So what is a repository? It's a class that says uh, I want to put that uh, this lessons. Um, of course, it's already annotated with an entity annotation. I want to put them in the database. And this is a class that allows us to actually say, give me a list of all of the lessons or find me a particular lesson. Or I created a lesson I want to store in the database. So if you actually, uh, this extends the Panache repository uh, that does that for us. So basically, um, if, if uh, we can all of the, we can call on any of those methods on those. So what I do have created is for the lesson, lesson repository, for the room repository, and of course for the time slots. So in all three cases, I've said I want to be able to store and read these entries from the database. And then I've created a demo generator. And what the demo generator does is when the application starts up, so it listens to a startup event, it's going to create some test data. And at the end of that, it's going to persist that test data into, for example, this case, into the time slots repository. So this demo generator uh, listens to 
when the uh, Quarkus container starts up. It says, okay, in that case, uh, it will create, for example, a time slot here for Monday at 8.30 for, and um, another one at Monday for 9.30 and so forth. And it will store those in the database through this method. Same thing, it would create a number of rooms, A, B, C, D, A, B, C here, and put those in the database. Now, now um, the those repositories will automatically be injected, as you can see. We'll, we'll inject them here so we can use them. Now, one thing I want to show you with, with Quarkus, why Quarkus, why developing in Quarkus is so much fun, why they call it supersonic atomic, atomic Java and so forth, is if you, for example, change this into the dev, uh, devconf uh, room, right? And I now switch to over here and I refresh on the top right, uh, left, what you will see is that it immediately changes to devconf, room devconf, right? So let, let's see that again. Let's, let's change that to something else. Let's say devconf2, switch over there, click the refresh button, and it's immediately updated here. So how does that work? How uh, First of all, how fast is that? It's actually, you can actually look in the console how, how long that took. And that took, uh, in this case, uh, uh, one second, over one second. Usually it's half a second, but clearly sharing my screen and, and uh, all of the other stuff that's running for around that is taking quite some CPU. This is a computer from 2015, so it's definitely not a recent one. Now, okay, um, how, what, what happened there? Well, it's restarted the entire application, the entire application. So let's, 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 let's look at that in, in, in case, right? So at Maven Quark is dev. What does that Quarkus dev restart do? Well, when it normally starts, what you do is when the uh, when you run Maven Quarkus dev, it compiles all of the sources. It it goes to the relational database, which is an in, in memory H2 database that uh, it also starts up first. It drops and creates the entire schema, which means that if we add a field to the lesson class, uh, it automatically the database schema would be adjusted uh, uh, accordingly. It inserts the test data. That's that demo test generator class that we have just gone to, through. That's, of course, custom code for our domain here that says I want a room A, B, C, and so forth. So it actually does that for us. And um, now, what if a little bit later we do the, we go to the application and we click on the get method, or, you know, we, we just browse to that local host 8080 URL. What we get is it does some SQL queries to this database to get all of the time slots, all of the rooms, and all of the lessons as we've seen, and it and then sends that back as a timetable object. That takes a few milliseconds. Where it really gets interesting is when we go back into our sources, and in those sources we change room C into room devconf, right? Uh, so we change some source files in our IDE. Is what happens when that uh, when we then ask for another when we do another get of that index? What actually happens is when we do a get of that index file, it, it actually triggers a restart because Quarkus sees, okay, you want to call a REST method on me, but um, I actually know that some of your files, I'm also monitoring your source files in your ID, some of your Java files, they're changed. So at that point, what it does, it compiles, compiles those changed sources, those Java files. It restarts the, the whole server, drop, create, uh, to get the schema of the relational database up to date. It inserts that test data again, including you know my room devconf this time instead of room C. And then of course it actually does the, re the whole thing that it needed to do, namely do re uh, service the request and actually does the SQL queries for that request. So just calls the rest uh, code behind that. Sends us back as JSON. And the whole thing, well, should be less than a second, but on this computer with this streaming audio on, it was actually 1.7 seconds. Uh, still something I find uh, acceptable during development. Um, to, so that means I make a change, and in less than two seconds in this case, I can see the results of that change. So let's move this back to DevCon, show this one more time in, in action. So we move, well, move this back to room C. So I move this room back to room C, and I go here and I refresh here. I see there's a question, so let me ask you what's that. What has been the biggest planning challenge that you or others solved with OptoPlanner so far? Ooh, um, vehicle routing cases with uh, tens of thousands of vehicles is, is a lot of fun. Um, employee rostering cases for where there's a big diversity of, uh, uh, of constraints that they want and not just uh, a few dozens, but dozens and dozens of constraints, that, that, that was fun. Um, let me think about that for until the end of the presentation to maybe, um, there's probably more um, 
Okay, so here we go. Um, let's continue. So we have it running now. Um, what else do we have here? So I went through all, over all of these classes. I think it's time to add a little bit of AI into this story, right? So again, that solve button still doesn't work and we still want that to work, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to add AI opt planning optimization with OptoPlanner. And um, so we're basically good. Uh, you know, adding OptoPlanner to the mix. And in our timetable class, OptoPlanner needs to know what it can change, right? Um, it has a, this lesson class has a subject, the teacher has a time slot. Can OptoPlanner decide to give this lesson a different teacher? No, it cannot. Can it decide to give it a different student group or different subject? Now everybody who wanted to do math gets French instead. No, it can't, right? So instead we need to we need to, so we need to tell Opto what, what, OptoPlanner what it can change. And those are actually those time slot and those room things. So what we do is we add, just like you can add JPA annotations, you can also add OptoPlanner annotations on fields. And we, what we specifically do is we say, okay, that time slot, that's a planning variable. That's something that changes during planning, right? Uh, the room, same, same principle. Any class that has one or more planning variables is called the planning entity and needs a planning entity annotation. So that's basically how we tell OptoPlanner, okay, start looking into this class or something there that you're, you're going to need to change during planning. And um, so basically before planning, the time slot and room fields are null, right? And after, so before solving, and after solving, they are non-null. So OptoPlanner will assign them for us. Okay, so... Um, Back to the coding side. Let's start implementing that. Uh, so that was that, uh, again, that undo uh, and support operation exception here at the bottom. So in a few, we'll, we'll be fixing that right now. So here we go. We go to the lesson. We say, okay, this is something that actually changes during planning. So what we're going to do is we're going to say this. Some of the fields in this class change during planning. We're going to give that a planning entity annotation. And what is going to change is the time slot. So we're going to say, okay, this is the, this, is a planning variable. This is something that uh, changes during planning. So for those 20 lessons that we're assigning to 10 time slots and then to three rooms, uh, for each of those instances, it will pick a time slot and it will also pick a room. So we're going to make that also a planning variable, the room, right? Now, um, OptoPlanner needs to know where can I find the time slots to pick from. And so what you need to also say is I'm going to give it a value range ref uh, value range means a, re a range of values to pick from. And for now, I'm just going to call this the time slot range. And where we actually have a list of those time slots that we're going to use the same ID and that's how they're going to be uh, coupled together. Uh, similarly, I need to, OptoPlanner cannot just invent rooms for me. You cannot say, oh, I'll, I'll make room D and E and, and then you know I'll start assigning things to that. No, it needs to pick from room A, B, or C. That are, that are the options. So somehow we need to tell them, okay, this is room A, B, and C that you can pick from, right? So again, we have this, uh, we make an ID, room arrange, and somewhere else we're going to take this, uh, we're going to define it. So where is a list of times and a list of rooms? Well, if you remember, we had the time timetable object, right? And that timetable object is actually not just ideal to send to the client with a list, here's all of our data, but also to send to OptoPlanner. We can just say, okay, here OptoPlanner, here's the timetable, please solve that for me. So what we need to do is we need to say, okay, this is uh, a, a value range, a value range. This this is the, uh, sorry, first of all, this is a, a planning solution, right? This means that this is something that's opto. This is uh, something that we give to OptoPlanner. It solves it and then it gives it back to us. So when it gives it back to us, it is a solution. That's why the planning solution annotation is on that. And then this time slot list is actually uh, will give us the list of time slots for OptoPlanner to choose from. So we make that a value range provider, and we say, okay, uh, we put it. We give it the same ID as uh, we we did earlier. This is our time slot range. Similarly, for our rooms, we're going to say this is our range of rooms. So now OptoPlanner knows when it says, okay, when I need to assign math, right, where, which, which time slots and which rooms can I pick from? It well says, okay, I need to look in the time slot range. And basically is between these lists of time slots for the time slots and between these lists of rooms for the room. We need to also tell OptoPlanner, you know, where are the lessons you want you to optimize? Uh, it cannot just 
plug those lessons out of thin air. It needs to get those 20 lessons some, it needs to get access to those, those somehow. So what we do here is we say, okay, this is a planning entity collection property. It basically means, uh, and a list is a collection, right? So it basically means that this is the list that we want you to assign. There's one more thing we need to do here is when OptoPlanner solves this and then gives this uh, uh, this planning solution instance uh, an, an instance of this planning solution back to us, we this will get a score. OptoPlanner will, will give a score to it. That's how it figures out if this is a good or a bad solution. So we're going to add a score uh, here, uh, specifically a hard soft score, right? Because we have hard and soft uh, constraints. And uh, let's import that. Okay, let's import that. And that come as you can see there. And we're going to also tell OptoPlanner, right? Um, this is where our score field is. Uh, so we need to uh, give it a planning score annotation. Uh, for JXB and so forth, I will also add uh, a getter for that score. Here we go. So our times table class is, is ready. This is, we can now give this to OptoPlanner. And when OptoPlanner starts solving it, there's a number of hard and soft constraints as we talked about, but where is that list of hard and soft constraints? Well, we don't have one yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new package called uh, Solver. I'm going to put there one class in there. Um, yeah, maybe I make a little bit too many packages if I'm only creating one class in there. And so this is the timetable constraint provider. And that will give us the list of constraints because this one will implement the constraint provider interface. Constraint provider interface. Come and if I write that correctly, I get code help. And and this has actually just one method, which is uh, define constraints. Mm -hmm. So this is where we say, okay, these are the constraints we want to apply, the hard and soft constraints to apply. So for example, we don't want two lessons in the same room at the same time. So what are we going to do here? For now, we're just going to return an empty array. And later we'll add some constraints, but for now we don't need any constraints. Everything is fine, right? Uh, no interface in, was expected here. This is of course implements, not extends. Here we go. Okay. Um, one more thing that we need, we need to actually use this, right? So how can we, how can, when we call the solve method, we throw this unsupported operation exception, we actually need to do something here. So to be able to do something there, what we do is we inject a solver manager. This is something that comes from OptoPlanner and that allows us to um, solve problems. So for example, uh, this will, we want to have a solver manager for a timetable. Right. And so I'm going to create a solver manager. I'm going to inject it. It also, besides that it solves timetables, it also needs to know if we give it a job, it will uh, it wants to jo a job ID. And we can choose whether that's a long, a string, or a UUID, or anything else. So we need to give that type too, so, because it's typed on that. OK, so I'm injecting the solver manager. So now I can I can actually solve a data set. So now I can actually say, okay, when, when we click that green button in the UI, what do we do? We tell the solver manager, okay, solver manager, please solve and listen. Listen means that it will also send the events of new improved solutions back to the UI. And um, then we get to say, okay, it says, okay, you wanna, you wanna do me a job, you need to tell me what is the problem ID. I'm just going to hard code it to one, uh, one right now. And then we need to give him two functions. The first function is to load the problem. The second function is to save the problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first give him, given a problem ID, I'm going to say load the timetable. If you remember, we had that loan timetable class here uh, method here, which go, basically goes to the repository, lists all of the lessons, sorts them by day of week in the query, um, and same thing we do for the rooms and for the lessons, and that's how we create the timetable class. So we're actually going to load uh, that in, uh, you know, uh, timetable uh, class from the database by loading all of the time slots, all of the rooms, and all of the lessons. And then every time we find a new, better solution, what we're going to do is given uh, a, sol a solution, which is actually a timetable, so timetable. What we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to save it 
and save is another method down here. Uh, it's a pretty simple method. What it does is it goes through all of the lessons of that timetable and stores the uh, time slot and the room into the database. Um, so, okay. So um, let's try that out. Um, let's hope this works. It's a live coding session. Uh, could go see how well that works. First of all, we're going to click the refresh button. I clearly did something wrong. So multiple classes, timetable constraint provider and my constraint provider found that implement the interface. Panda.org. Uh, okay, but I don't have it here and I know what I did. Uh, I started my Maven Corcus dev without doing it clean. And in this repository, I was playing sometimes. So uh, I, I did have a my constraint timetable class there. So that will go away now. Um, normally, I don't have to restart Maven Corcus dev. But um, this is clearly an exception when I was mixing, uh, running just plain Maven versus Quarkus. Uh, and uh, so normally when you develop Quarkus, you don't have to do this. Uh, let's take a look what's going on. Uh, yeah, and Quarkus dev is ready. So here we go. Um, up, no errors, so that's good. Um, yeah, let, let me just show you that. If I make an error in here, if I, for example, uh, let's say put this here, right? And we do refresh, you will see that that actually crashes, right? Quark is that's not a statement. So if you go back here, fix that again, Quark is that we can immediately see the results of that. Okay, um, let's see if it can solve our problem. We click the solve button. It's going to assign these lessons to those uh, slots, but there's a problem. There are no constraints. It assigns everything to room A at 8.30. And clearly, this is not a good schedule for lessons for, because everybody is now in the same room at the same time. So what we need to do is we need to go back to our constraint provider and actually add a constraint for that. Now, you could do that in a few different ways. You could, for example, uh, say, OK, I'm going to create uh, what we call an easy score calculator. And where you go through with a loop through all of the lessons, lesson A, lesson B, and you see, are they in the same time slot? Are they in the same room? And if that's the case, you actually have two rooms, uh, two lessons in the same time slot at the same time. Right? This works. You can implement this. Uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, except for the fact that it's not that scalable. And you re really want to, you know, there's a lot of potential solutions to look at. So the faster this code is, the, the more scalable this code is, the better. So it's not incremental, right? What does it mean? When the room of the math lesson changes, it checks again if French and chemistry use the same room. So every time we make a small change where, for example, we change the math lesson, it actually checks also if, you know, French and chemistry are still under the same room. But that hasn't changed. Either they were or they weren't, but changing math won't actually affect that. And uh, this is a big scalability difference. So instead of that, what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, constraints, uh, uh, constraint streams here, and this is actually a constraint provider, which will do that in a much uh, in an incremental way for us. So what are we going to do is we're going to say, okay, I want a room conflict constraint. So let's make a method for that. Uh, the constraint factory is the thing that will create the constraints for us. So uh, we're going to pass that along, right? And so in this one, in this method, we're going to actually create that, uh, that, that constraint that says, don't put two lessons in the same room at the same time. We're going to say, okay, constraint factory, please select me a lesson. So, so here we go, lesson.class. Uh, so, okay. And then uh, please join that with another lesson.class. So now we have selected two lessons. It's very much like SQL. So select me one lesson and then for, uh, join that with any other lesson, right? Okay. And in the end, we'll actually do a penalize on that to say, okay, we don't want this to happen every time we have two lessons in the same room at the same time, it's bad. But we, of course, need to specify that they are in the same room at the same time. So what are we else we're going to do here? We're going to say, okay, um, I want to make sure that these two lessons are using the same room. So we say, we if they have these two lessons that I just selected, have an equal room, right? then um, we can continue here. And if they also have an equal time slot, if they're actually at the same time, all right, get time slot, 
um, then uh, we definitely want to penalize that that's bad, right? So this is the, then we have an actual room conflict, and that's an and that's very bad because it's a hard constraint broken. So what are we going to do? Is we're going to say uh, that breaks one hard constraint, right? Now um, you can see this is a method reference, so that means for people who are not familiar with that. Uh, that's basically uh, a lambda, and so that means you can call, call any code in here on your lesson to figure out, um, uh, to merely make this dynamic, and uh, that's quite useful. Uh, yes, Lubomir? Yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting you. Uh, you have just uh, five minutes left. Oh, yes, you know. thank you. So let's see how this works out. Do we get a better schedule? So let's go back to our UI, and let's Press refresh. So Quarkus is now rebooting the entire application from scratch. Uh, you can see that the, the, the test is assigned again. And we and we click the, the solve button, we get our first schedule. Now, this looks better, right? Because every lesson is in, uh, we never have two lessons in the same room at the same time. There's still a few problems with this because this would be easy to solve, right? Any human can figure this out and, and find the schedule. The problem is if only we look for teacher, right? Now we, we have here, you can see Marie Curie, two, two lessons at the same time, right? And that's impossible because you know we one person cannot be in two places at the same time. And when we look at the student group, we see similar issues, right? Here you can see it, two lessons at the same time for student group. 10a and that's what makes it hard also for us humans when you want to want to create a schedule like this it's actually quite hard to uh, because when you make changes here you then affect the rooms again and it's 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 it's, it's uh, a lot of uh, in the, tra the uh, wires that that uh, it may it's difficult to change right so what are we going to do is we're going to actually create uh, two more constraints in here we're going to create a teacher conflict constraint that will check if two lessons uh, for the same teacher are happening at the same time and the same ID for a student group if we have two uh, if you have a student group that has two lessons at the same time that's bad too um, for the sake of uh, time I will just copy paste this room conflict constraint because it's very similar so the first one is a teacher conflict and the second one is a student group conflict right this one is the so when we have a lesson and for the teacher conflict, right? And we have another lessons. On those two lessons, don't we don't care if they have the same room or not. We care if they have the same teacher. So if they have the same teacher, and they are happening at the same time. So if we have two lessons, same teacher, same time, then of course we have a teacher conflict, right? Now for the student group, when we have two lessons and they are for the same student group, so it gets the the student group is the same, and again they're happening at the same time. Then of course we have a student group conflict. So here we go. Let's try that out. We go back here. We press the refresh button. Let's see how long it took for Quarkus to actually refresh this. Oh, it's getting worse. Um, I don't know what's going on with my computer. Usually when I do this locally, it's really it's half a second. But still, three seconds or 2.5 seconds, uh, that's acceptable to me. When it gets to three seconds, I'm going to start complaining, though. Um, so here we go. We, let's, let's click the solve button. Let's see. Uh, what happens? We get a schedule here. You can see uh, every room has its own uh, has their own. Uh, so never two lessons in the same room at the same time. When you look at it per teacher, we can see there's no never a teacher that has two lessons at the same time. When you look at it student group, we can see uh, the same thing. Uh, this is a feasible schedule. So feasible means no hard constraints broken, and you can actually put this in production. Is it a perfect schedule? Far from it. If we should look at it from a uh, a former teacher group uh, perspective. Uh, for example, Marie Curhier, Curhier in this case, she actually has pauses between the lessons, right? She, she needs to come two days. Um, they, 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 the teachers really prefer a compact schedule, right? And you can do that. What you can do is you can uh, just add another constraint that says when there are gaps between two lessons, uh, penalize that. And that's exactly what we have implemented in the quick start. So you can take a look at in the quick start if you want to know uh, how to implement that and that is a soft constraint because you will always have some violations of that but you still want to minimize the violations of that so that's the difference between a hard and a soft constraint hard constraints if you don't fulfill them your schedule is not feasible your soft constraints um, you are willing to break those but as least as possible now 
if you want to get started with all this, if you say, okay, this looks cool, I think I have an interesting uh, uh, use case to solve with OptoPanner, what you want to do is you want to go to, um, you want to check out the, the uh, Opstart, uh, OptoPlanner uh, Quick Starts uh, repository. So um, if you go to OptoPlanner.org, there's a link on the front page directly to this repository. And what it basically, you just clone it, the Quick Starts repository. You go to, for example, the school timetabling uh, uh, use case. We have many more, maintenance, scheduling, vehicle routing, and so forth. And in any of those, you just do Maven Quarkus Dev, and you go to localhost, and you'll see the results there. And you can start changing the code, add some constraints, change some of the data, for your needs as you see fit. Now, if there's questions, I'll happily answer those. And uh, if you want more information, these are the websites to look at. OK, uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Geoffrey. Uh, yeah. We have only one question in Q&A, but you already answered it. I'm not sure whether you, you want to get back to it. But... Yeah, it's it's a, it's a good question. So what has been the biggest challenge you or others solved at Oplopreneur so far? Mm. Um, I had a few. There was on, on Kaggle, there's a yearly Santa competition. And uh, there was there was an interesting one once here where we had to figure out how to do volume packing of of the sleigh. So basically, there's supposed to be Santa's gifts, and you need to figure out how to uh, order them and in which order you need to put them in in the sleigh so you minimize the amount of of um, lost capacity in, into a truck. So in the real world, trucks have this problem too. Um, that was really out of our normal comfort zone for what kind of problems we solve with OptoPlanner. Um, that, that was that was a toy example, of course. It, it was just a fun Kaggle competition. Um, in the real world, um, fairness is always fun. Uh, first, you need to define what a fairness constraint is. You know, when um, there's multiple versions of that, uh, we have we have those. We, we support those, of course. Um, I know it's it's. Well, OptoPlanner has been used across the, the globe. Um, for example, in Belgium, the pharmacies are actually their own duty is scheduled with OptoPlanner. Uh, it, it, all of the all cases are interesting. Um, oh, the biggest the biggest is definitely uh, the 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 vehicle routing in the US, where we you know tens of thousands of vehicles, uh, hundreds of thousands of stops per day are actually scheduled every day with OptoPlanner. So that's arguably the biggest one, uh, or maybe. Uh, there's a case where we do in a country all measures it to hearing assignments. So it depends on how you measure and, uh, what is big or small. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your uh, answer. Uh, we don't have yeah. uh, any time. So if you would like to uh, continue, feel free to uh, to go to Discord or uh, Work Adventure. It's a yeah. virtual platform where you can uh, interact with each other. So feel free to go there and uh, uh, you can uh, you can talk to them about yeah. about it. Uh, I'll I'll, I'll go to Discord right now. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you bye. very much again, and bye. Uh, bye.